You may want to take your Bibles and turn with me to Prophecy of Habakkuk. Prophecy of Habakkuk, the time, the two times that we are here, that's the subject that, that's the word that the Holy Spirit has laid upon my heart to share with you. I'll give a, maybe a one minute explanation of different prophecies that we have in the Bible. So all the prophecies, prophetical writers can be divided into three segments. It might be helpful for you to know these differences. You have the pre-exilic prophets, exilic prophets, and first exilic prophets. Everything, everything is connected. I'm trying to explain it so that uh, the 70 year captivity, which was predicted by Jeremiah, began the time of times of the Gentiles. And so it is good for us to know what are pre exilic prophecies like Jeremiah, Isaiah, Hosea and others, they are all free exilic prophets. They were the prophets who predicted the 70 year captivity of Israel. And then you have the exilic prophets. These are the prophets who prophesied during the 70 years of captivity. That is Ezekiel and Daniel are exilic prophets. The prophecy was written during the 70 year captivity. Then you have the first exilic prophecy. These are prophecies that were written after the children of Israel came back from captivity under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah and so forth. That prophecies include the large the Malachi and the prophets before that. So you know to better understand the prophecy that we are considering this evening, you should know where they are whether there is a pre-exilic or exilic or post-exilic prophet. Habakkuk was a pre-exilic prophet. Before the Babylonian captivity, God raised him up. And when you read the book of Habakkuk, he make mention of what God is preparing to take the people captive in the 70 year period. The, some of the expressions that they use, they are not Babylonian. That's not what is used in the Habakkuk prophecy. It is primarily the Chaldeans and so forth, they are, they are the same as Babylonian. And prophecy of Habakkuk is one of the most influential prophecy of the Old Testament. This is the only kind of prophets where the, wor the words of the prophet was quoted three times in the New Testament. The word that is quoted there is faith. He's a prophet of faith. The first chapter deals with the test of faith. And the second chapter deals with the faith that God taught the prophet. And then the third chapter deals with the triumph of faith. 
it is good to have an idea of these three chapters and what it entails so that we may understand what this prophecy is all about. So, you will find, especially in the book of Habakkuk, that the, it's a, the prophecy starts in an unusual way. If you look at chapter one, it starts out by saying, the burden which the prophet saw. What is this burden all about? This is the most unusual way we, in which Habakkuk opens the chapter. What God did was that one day, God opened the eyes of the prophet to see what was actually going on in the society, primarily the Jews, Jews and the Judah and Benjamin. The 10 tribes are already in captive. They are already kept in captivity. But this, uh, this section, the book of Habakkuk has to do primarily with uh, Judah, Judah and Benjamin. And we are told that the burden that he saw what is the burden he's talking about? The burden that he's talking about is when God opened his eyes to see what was actually going on among the people of God, the Jewish people. When he saw what was going on among them, he did something unusual. He began to cry to God. You see that in your, the burden that which he, Habakkuk saw, Oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear me? Now for someone to go to God and say, how long shall I cry? It at least, it doesn't tell, tell us whether he cried to God one week or two weeks or one month. It, it tells us that he cried to God for a very long period of time. He is not the only person who cried when he's the condition of the people of God. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. And he wept for the people of God. And Nehemiah, when he heard that Hanani, his brother, came and took that long journey and came and told him the condition of the walls of Jerusalem and the gates and all that and the people of God that were settled there he said they live in reproach the, the gates are burned and all this when he reported what he was actually going on back home Nehemiah began to weep and cry and fast for days and God prepared him to speak to his king. And uh, so the, you know, you will find when you, when you look at the prophets of old, there are people who wept for the people of God. And that we sometimes we are, have any no burden of what is going on. Now the prophet is not talking about what is going on among the the, the, the Gentiles. 
He's talking about what is going on among the people of God. Let me give, take a look at verse 3. You will find that it is a dialogue with God. He, he went to God in prayer. And he began to mention to God, Lord, don't you see the iniquity and the trouble, plundering and strife and contention, injustice and paralysis of judgment and the law is paralyzed. That was the condition, spiritual condition of the people of God. And he began to weep over them. Uh, so God at this point, I don't know how long it took for God to respond to Habakkuk. But God broke the silence. God broke, God broke the silence and said these words. God telling Habakkuk, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded. For I will work a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told you. There are times God delays the answers because we are not ready to receive the answer that God has. So God is telling the prophet, I know I you have been crying. I, I know that I am the one who caused you to see all these things. I know that. But he was he, he was, God was telling him be astoundly be astounded about these things. I am doing a work in your days. If I tell you, you won't believe it. You are, we are not ready to receive the answer that God has. So God said these words to them. I'll tell you what I am doing. I am raising these Chaldeans. You want to look at your Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 7. He tells them they are terrible and dreadful. They are, their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. On and on, he tells them what kind of a people are the Chaldeans, whom God was raising up to take Judah captive. They are fierce people, we are told. They, they told the prophet. And the charges charge ahead. Cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings 
and princes are scorned by them. They deride the every stronghold for they uh, right. deride every stronghold for they keep up earthen mounds and seize it. And so forth, he said to them, then after that, they worship their false, ascribe all these things to their false gods. These are the kind of people I am raising up to teach a lesson to the people of God. Mm -hmm. And that actually made things worse for the prophet. The prophet stopped complaining about the Jewish Judah and Benjamin and their sinful propensities and so forth. The prophet stopped complaining and became an ardent intercessor of the people of God at that time. He did not want these Chaldeans to come and destroy the people of God. That's not the intent that he had. That's not what he had in mind when he went to God. But God told him, God sees what is going on. This is payback time. Whatsoever a man sows, he will reap. If you sow wind, we are told in the book of Hosea, they reap well wind. And it doesn't matter what party is in power at that point in time. So the prophet in comes to God. <clears throat> the second dialogue that we have here is that he began to lay hold upon God. And while he was give, laying hold upon God, he said, Oh, you are not, are you not from everlasting? Oh, Lord, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. Oh, Lord, you have appointed them for correction, for judgment, for oh, rock, you have marked them for correction. And then he had a question to God. I want you to especially underscore that question he has to God. Are you not of your eyes than to behold evil <clears throat> and cannot look upon the wickedness? Why do I look on, why do you look upon those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked swallows up a person more righteous than he. So the prophet went to God and said, God, how could you allow the wicked Chaldeans to swallow up Jewish, Jewish people who are less wicked than the Chaldeans. How can you allow them to let the people of God captive and, and uh, deal with them the way that it is outlined there for us? They are you are of pure eyes than to behold evil. You are a holy God. How can you, holy God, allow an unholy people to punish those who are more righteous than the, these people? that he is going to use 
to teach a lesson to them. It makes sense. But unfortunately, when God looks at man, he's not looking at what percentage of him, of, of good works that he does and so forth. He doesn't call someone more righteous and less righteous. Because that's not how God works. So God, <clears throat> God said, he will raise up these Chaldeans to come and punish the people of God. And the prophet was, prophet didn't know what to say. He was troubled in his mind as to why, how that God could do this. How can you watch and allow these things to take place? So they said, Are you going to allow them to continue to do this? And so forth. So the prophet came to God and complained about the way that God was going to punish the people of God using these Chaldeans. At this point, prophet did something. He withdrew himself from the mainstream of life in chapter 2, verse 1. And he went to the watchtower. By the way, that's a word that is used by a cult for their magazine, but that has nothing to do with the watchtower here. It was a place where he would go and spend time in prayer waiting upon the Lord. And the prophet withdrew himself from what is going on in the society and took time away to be alone with God in his life. Perhaps we can learn a lesson from that. See, the perspective of the prophet was very troubling for him. He couldn't understand how the, this holy God could allow the unholy people like the Chaldeans to conquer the promised land, the, the people of Judah and Benjamin, and take them captive. And so he withdrew himself and began to pray and began to he spent time in the watchtower. The scripture says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. So we have to learn to wait upon the Lord. We cannot just simply go into the presence of God and ask for, uh, with our problems and difficulties, and expect God to instantly give us answers? No, the prophet is used to waiting upon the Lord. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 63, it says, to God alone, I wait in silence. And I, began to look at the life of other great people of God. They all waited upon the Lord for a long time. And God molded their character in the, in the silence in that hours when he waited upon the Lord. He did that with Moses. The backside of the desert was the place, the barren place, humanly speaking, was the place that God used 
to mold the character of Moses for 40 years. And uh, it's, uh, it's also true about David. David spent running away from Saul. He's, he was driven into the wilderness. And these were the places where God molded his life. That is there. And we, we need to understand that there are times God has a strange way of preparing people for serving him in there. Mm -hmm. Finally, he went, I don't know how long he spent his time on the watchtower, waiting for God's answer to his question. He wanted to find out exactly from God why that God is doing this. And this is the core of this prophecy. As a result of that, God revealed himself to the prophet. And we if you want to find out, look at chapter 2. He was told to write the vision, make it plain on the tablets so that he may run who reads it. That means the, that the sense of urgency. The vision is set for an appointed time, he said. And at the end, it will speak. And it will not end. And Though it tarries, wait for it. Then he gives you that vision. I said that there are three books in the New Testament that quote from this one verse. I want to spend a little time on that, at least part of that verse. I said the core of this prophecy is the word faith. So what the Lord did when the prophet asked the question, he waited upon the Lord as to how God is going to deal with this issue. And God gave a new revelation. This is what was quoted by three of the writers. Actually, it is, it could all be by the apostle. First, it was quoted, by the way, in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Chapter 116, it says, we, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and then to the Greeks. Now, underscore this. For in it, in, in what? In the gospel. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. For it is written, and then they quote the verse here. The righteous shall live by faith. 
That is the revelation that the prophet received. The faith, three places, at one of them is the gospel. The power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. In the gospel, God reveals the righteousness of God. And what is that righteousness of God? The just shall live by faith. That is the core of the prophecy. The just shall live by faith. That's in Romans chapter 1. Then you go to Galatians chapter 3 verse 11. You read there that no flesh is justified by the works of the law. And the just shall live by faith. By the flesh, by the works of the flesh, works of, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. If that was the way that we are going to come to God, we would never have, we, not one of us would have ever, ever made it there. It is all by faith. Mm -hmm. I said this is, this particular quotation is used very forcefully in these three places, touch the lives of great men and women. I understand that Luther, when he wrote the commentary on the book of Galatians, he especially pointed out the importance of the just shall live by faith. And that is what was used by the Holy Spirit of God for the salvation of John Wesley. Imagine the impact of that verse and that revelation to the life of John Wesley who changed the world by the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. John Wesley, the man who preached the gospel, 50,000 gospel sermon, sermons on horseback that transformed the people, thousands and thousands of people. That it's a all the core of that, this prophecy is the righteous shall live by faith. The third place it is quoted there, we are told, it is in the book of Hebrews chapter 10. And Hebrews chapter 10 we read, he who comes, and this is about the coming of the Lord. He said, if he tarries, do not draw back. Be faithful and continue in the things of God, for the righteous shall live by faith. Those of us who expect and look forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not to Turn back because it has taken 2,000 years after he made the promise. The promise of the Savior was made 6,000 years before that in the Garden of Eden. And we, we are looking forward to the fulfillment of what God has said about his coming. And 
do not slide back or backslide when you are waiting for the Lord. So the, these three different places, this gospel is used. This gospel that the righteous are live by faith is used to help us understand that this is the essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, he told the prophet Habakkuk, the righteous shall live by faith. But I didn't say anything yet about the other half of the revelation that is given there. The other half of the revelation that is given there is this. He whose heart is puffed up with pride shall fail. The arrogant, the proud, that actually is a characterization of the Yeah, the proud and the arrogant, not only that, you, we have to understand that the people who are fucked up with pride, on the one side, he, what the prophet did was that, God did was that, he, he's on one side of the equation, you have those who are proud and arrogant. On the other side of humanity are those who are just the just people who live by faith. Those who are puffed up, no matter who they are, ultimately will fail. And there are three examples that I can give you about those who are puffed up with pride, how they, they failed. The first one is Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar you, you will find this in the fifth chapter of the book of Daniel. One day, Nebuchadnezzar was walking, looking toward the great Babylon that he was built. The great Babylon he built. And God only gave him a vision by saying that you are like that great tree that was cut off. And the stump is left there. So one day when this is a year after that warning that was given to him, the prophet gave a warning. The, the Nebuchadnezzar could have totally, completely avoided the judgment of God. But he didn't. He looked over the Babylon that he built and he said, Is this not the Babylon that I have built? That very moment, the judgment of God fell upon him. And he spent the next seven years like an animal. Now, it is given there in the book of Daniel chapter 5, 4. Daniel chapter 4. His grandson, Belshazzar, he became very strong and 
he called for a great party in chapter 5 of thousands of his lords. And he ordered the utensils from the temple of God that was preserved there to be brought so that they can drink wine in it. And while the party was going on, and he violated all these principles. A hand appeared right in front of him and wrote, Mene, Mene, Tegel, Farsen. Weighed in the balances and found bonding. That very night, he was slain by the Persians and his kingdom departed from him. If that is not enough, let me point out that God makes no distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles when it comes to judgment of God. And we find in the word of God very clearly about Uzziah. In Second Chronicles, we are told that Uzziah became very strong. He was he ruled the nation fifty-two years. Yet God has strengthened him, and he became great and big. And when he grew strong and big and famous, he wanted to get into the holy place and burn incense. And he, he would not listen to the priest. And then he was told, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense. It's so only for the priest. And he, bro he broke through them and tried to get in to burn incense. And at that very moment, the leprosy broke, broke out on his forehead. And he was taken into a leper's house and died as a leper. In Three, I use three examples that are given in addition to the one that Habakkuk is telling us. Behold, he whose soul is puffed up in himself shall fail. Whatsoever a man shall sow, he shall also reap. If he sows wind, we are told, they will reap whirlwind. Well God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man shall sow, he shall also reap. So that is the vision that God has given. When this vision was given to the prophet, we need to what the prophet did was that they are five woes connected directly to these people who refused to listen to the word of God. Refused to understand what faith is in their life. And we can learn from that. So the chapter two of the book of Habakkuk tells us about the kind of manifestations of sin that permeate the lifestyle, life of the people who refuse to trust in the Jehovah God, who are puffed up with pride. That is what I want to 
especially study as we study in our next message. We are looking, we have only looked at uh, one aspect of one side of the this and use three illustrations I have given for us to understand that righteous shall live by faith with all what is going on all around us, we need to understand that those who are fucked up in themselves will ultimately fail. God resists the proud and he grace to the humble. And let this mind be in you as it was in Christ Jesus. Though he was co-equal with the Father, he thought it not robbery to equal with him, but he humbled himself and became a bond slave. And we find there that having crowned himself as a man, he applied, he I can I can turn <laughs> Turn to the passages, but the, he became obedient even to the death of the cross. Therefore, God has ex highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every other name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. May God bless these thoughts to our hearts this evening. The righteous shall live by faith. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him righteous as righteous in the sight of God in Genesis chapter 15. And we need to understand that we have one example after the other throughout the scriptures to illustrate what the prophet Habakkuk has said. Humanity is divided into two segments. One segment, they are propped up with pride. The other segment is they live by faith. And Something really happened in the life of the prophet through all this process. When that which ha happened in the life of the prophet, we need to understand. He stopped being a complainer, by the way. Stop being, he was complaining to God what, how God is dealing with, uh, is tolerating all the sins among the people of God. You need to understand that God to tolerates sin only to be found that they that commit such sin will be, will perish. Because by their life, that we know them. So, I hope that you will take a moment and read through the remainder of the chapter of the book of Habakkuk, chapter two and three. And we want to really enjoy the study of how this prophet has transformed. He was transformed by God and it is recorded there for us to know. There are 10 things that we can take home. That is what I want to cover in the will of the Lord in the tomorrow morning. Thank you for the opportunity to minister the word of God. I trust that the word will reproduce itself in fruitfulness in our Christian life in the days to come. 
Let me pray. Our gracious and our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to study the book of Habakkuk and learn from the core of that message that you have given for the prophet to proclaim. And Father, how frightening it is to think of what happened Nebuchadnezzar and, and uh, Belshazzar, as well as Uzziah. We only touch the life of these people. There are more to learn from them. But well, Father, we pray that as we read through and study the book of Habakkuk, that you will open our eyes to understand how important it is for us to pray for the people of God. It's one thing to go and tell others about the problems and the fault of the, the various places. It's another thing to cry and weep for the people of God that they may re repent and turn from it evil way, walk in the way of God in the coming days. Thank you for hearing our prayers in Jesus' most wonderful name. Amen.